Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. It's just me this week recording the intro and outro because Tarek is busy jet-setting around the world. So uh, hopefully this will go okay. Um, Thanks again for tuning in for another episode. As you know, at the Page One Podcast, we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing process, their career, and generally try and get as many tips as we can from them about writing. Um, This week, our guest is ex-SAS soldier Andy McNabb, whose debut novel, Bravo 2-0, is still the best-selling military history book in the world, I think. Since then, Andy's gone on to write over 35 books, including fiction, non-fiction, young adult, and even kids' books. I went down to meet Andy myself when he was on a book tour, and he was a really lovely guy. Tarek uh, couldn't make the meeting, but he did dial in by Skype, so he is on the interview. We had a really interesting chat with Andy about how joining the army got him into reading and writing and how it helped develop his career as a professional author uh, and also how he's had tips from people such as Michael Mann when he worked as a consultant on the film Heat with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. So there's a lot in the chat, a lot of useful information from Andy and a lot of really interesting anecdotes as well. So hope you enjoy it. At the end of the podcast, I'll be back just to chat a bit more and also tell you about a competition we've got to win a couple of signed books from Andy as well. So I'll speak to you later, but enjoy the podcast. Uh, Reading about you, uh, you got into reading and writing quite late on in your life, is that right? I did, yeah. I I was, well, nearly uh, 17, 16, Mm -hmm. 17. So um, joined the the army uh, as what you call junior soldiers as a 16 year old uh, soldier and we had big plans to be a helicopter pilot because that's what the recruiting mm-hmm. film was showing all that sort of stuff yeah and then you go for a three-day assessment where you do physical tests make sure you know you fit enough but then academic tests and I was offered a place in the infantry and it was only when I got to this this organization called an infantry junior leaders battalion i was told the reason why we were there us lot rather than flying helicopters because we had um uh, the numeracy uh, 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 literacy and numeracy levels of anything between a nine and 11 year old and which is now known as key stage two within right. the educational okay. system so we were key stage two uh-huh. uh so uh as a you know nearly 17 year old sort of you know young soldier um i couldn't really read the sum properly. So there was words that I'd miss and uh, or make up, quite frankly, and get the, the whole premise wrong. Now write for the sun and write for, you know, broadsheets mm-hmm. and the and the you know the, the the basic premise is that the twelve year old must be able to at least understand what the argument is. They might not get all the detail, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It's if they understand what the argument was. I couldn't do that, it's nearly mm-hmm. seventeen. And so you got into this programme and that really Yeah. Oh, totally changed the yeah. ba- basically the uh, Sort of joining the infantry, you know, I thought I was getting ripped off here because I was marching off yeah, the education yeah. centre. And basically, it, it nothing's changed. You know, mm-hmm. still predominantly um, inner city, you know, uh, 18-year-old young men going in, into the infantry training, predominantly from inner cities and predominantly key, key stage two. Mm-hmm. The argument is you're not thick, as people think you are, you're mm-hmm. uneducated. Yeah. So... Uh, what well, the educator said to, to us, which changed, changed our lives, actually, he said, look, you know, the only reason you lot can't read and write is because you don't. Yeah. But that is what we do, because you've got to take information in and just as importantly, give information out. So, you know, y- your life starts here. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the first book, well, all of us read within this, this um, you know, literary classroom uh, uh, environment, we called them educators rather than, you know, teachers. Yes. But um, uh, we read a, a, a book from a, primary school series at the time called Janet and John. So right. we read Janet and John book 10, which was you know, designed for 10 year old sort of school kids. Mm-hmm. And very sort of just, you know, we learned about sentence structure and paragraph structure, because that's all it was, you know, it was one page of pictures yep. explaining what was the words were all mm-hmm. about. And then at the end there was a vocabulary and um, we went all through it, all of us with the educator for a week. And then we had a one-to-one with him where we read the book. So f- from that, um Obviously, opened up all these opportunities for you, presumably. Yeah, well, basically, well, initially in the, in, in the military, because you know you can be the best soldier on the planet, but 
unless you get certain academic qualifications at certain levels and you create like a, a corporal level and sergeant level, you'll never get promoted. Mm. So there was an incentive then yeah. to get an education. But what I discovered and not at the time discovered, but realized was actually starting to read. You get addicted very easy. Yeah. You know, you just get addicted. And, and that's what happened for me. And, you know, certainly from that point as a 16 year old uh, junior soldier, what, what the educator said was, look, every time you read something, doesn't matter what it is, you know, magazine, a poster, it doesn't matter, a book, whatever, it doesn't matter. You get knowledge. And mm-hmm. then every time you get knowledge, you get power and mm-hmm. then to do the things you want to do. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, it, you know, th- th- those words are still in my head yeah. now. And it, it sort of kick started a, Mm-hmm. A sort of a, a point of sort, sort of trying to catch up with education. And then at what stage, obviously then you progress through the army um, yeah. and eventually Bravo to Zero comes out. Yeah. But at what stage did you think you would enjoy writing about writing stories? Um, when I was getting out of the army, it, mm-hmm. um, it was not a, a, a burning ambition. You mm-hmm. know, I never sort of looked at it as, well, you know, I'm going to try and write something or create something or anything like that. Basically, I'd done 18 years in the military. I had four years left. I was in the Special Air Service mm-hmm. by then. I'd just done 10 years in the Special Air Service. Um, so three years after the, uh, the Bravo 2 Zero experience. And I was getting out to go and work for a private military company. Um, down in, in South America during the drug wars that, mm-hmm. were, that were going on down there. So as, as I was getting out, there was an approach made for me by a, 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 a senior uh, officer who was part of the headquarter element in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia during the war. I said, well, look, we're going to write this book about what was going on in the war okay. from the higher sort of view and everything. You then put in your Bravo to Zero experience and then we can then actually say what was going on and what were our assessments were when you was captured, all that sort of stuff. So I thought about it and I thought, well, actually, you know, it's not doing it for my benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, and thought, well, right, I'll give it a go myself because over the three years since uh, the Bravo to Zero um, uh, 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 operation, um, whilst I was still serving, I was given a lot of presentations of it to different military right, academies. Okay. And it's that normal debrief, you know, things that worked, things that didn't, things were going to mm-hmm. change, things were not, that sort of stuff to, diff- you know, Americans and Germans and French and, and yeah. different, different military academies. Mm-hmm. And um, so I knew the story. And then at that moment, I thought in my naivety, that's what you do. Yeah. So in, in effect, I just wrote a patrol report <laughs> and then so you know gave it to the, the publishers they said well this is all well and good but it's pretty boring and <laughs> so I went well that's what happened and he said well look what you've got to do you've got to be able to give that you know sense of place sense of environment got to put some uh, uh, emotion in it you know what you was feeling what you was thinking all those those sort of things you know describe the cold describe this so okay so what the the publisher said was read Joe Simpson's Touching the Void Oh yeah. Okay. I said if you can get what Simpson the way the Simpson describes even the basic things mm. of cold hands trying to manipulate the knots on on, yeah. on the rope. He says if you can do that and you get it in, you know, you you know, this thing might work. You you know, you you might stand a chance. So I read the book, read it yeah, quite a few well, I don't know how many times I've read it now, but read it loads of time. Refused to see the film when it came out, just in case it yeah, spoils yeah. the book. Uh-huh. But actually, I, I eventually saw it about five years ago, and it was great. So it, you know, it, it done. It, it didn't affect the book at all for me. Um, and then try to learn that. Uh, that yeah, the, yeah, you know, sense of place, sense mm-hmm. of environment. You know, trying to put in what, what was I thinking? What do I think about other people? What were they thinking? All those sort of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but that, well, it, you know, it sounds like you just you sort of done it. But that took about sort of four months of trying to layer and you know trying to do something with it. Um, and um, book went through the process, went through the MOD, went through the publishers, went out into into the into the shops, um, as in like another war sort of yeah, you yeah. Know, memoir. I was in Colombia when the um, working for this private military company uh, when the book came out. And the publishers phoned out and I said, look, this book's doing all right. You know, I thought, that's great, isn't it? You know, because as far as I was concerned at that time, that's the mortgage sorted. You yeah, know, yeah, they, yeah, they, absolutely. And that was it. Yeah, and yeah, that was yeah. it. It's just uh-huh. one book. Yeah. And I thought, that's great. And I said, well, yeah, you know, and, and in fact, now it's still the biggest war uh, book of all yeah. time. So uh-huh. war book of all time. And um, uh, they said, do you want to do another one? I thought, well, what do you think? You know, <laughs> guess, <laughs> get us a ticket and I'm off. Get me back here and I'll get into this writing business. Yeah. Not a clue mm-hmm. how to do it. Not a clue. But I uh, thought, all right, we'll give it a go. And, um, you know, because, you know, you're not getting shot, eye. If it doesn't work, well, fine. You just yeah, sort of yeah, move exactly. away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's great. Exactly. So, this, you know, and 
this 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 opportunity was for me anyway. Mm. It was just too mad not to not to have a go. So because of the success of Bravo, I started working in Los Angeles in films, and the very first film, literally, sort of right on the the the, the sort of back end of Bravo, I got an approach to go and work on a, a film in Los Angeles, um, which was called Heat, which was a mm-hmm. Bank Ma- robbery Michael film, Mann. Michael yeah, Mann, yeah. and and uh, you know Robert De Niro was the bank robber, mm. Al Pacino's police, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Lots of shooting downtown Los Angeles, basically what it was. It was great. So I was there for seven months and doing all the stuff that you do, all the all the training. But actually, for me, what 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 saved me to do with structure uh-huh. and saved me to do with the, if you like, you know the the. The, the the art of storytelling was listening to Michael Mann. You know, mm-hmm. this guy has, has you know been writing scripts yeah. and stories all of his life. So I said, well, look, I've been asked to get in, you know, and 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 and, and write. You know, I was going to do another um, uh, non-fiction, mm-hmm. which in, in, in in fact was going back before um, Bravo Two Zero. So almost loads of vignettes, yeah. rather than that linear yeah, yeah. story of of Bravo, and. Um, uh, and I was saying, well, look, worried about structure and how to, you know, I don't really know how to do it. He said, look, you've got to sh- just shut up. He says, don't worry about it. He says, everybody, whether they know it or not, yeah. understands a free act drama. Mm-hmm. Because we're all born, I'm telling you, know, 18-month, you know, 18-month-old babies understand storytelling, mm-hmm. you know, that they're, um, you know or they're already swiping the TVs as if it's an iPad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they understand it. So he said, look, free acts. Have a prologue. Set it up, your free acts. There's a problem. That's the problem affecting you. That's you resolving, resolving. the problem. Yeah. Have an epilogue, short and sharp, before they get bored. And he says, whatever you do in those three things, it's you know that's that's your job, isn't it? To get it in, get mm-hmm. you know, set up things and all that sort of stuff. Um, he says, but it's a free act drama. So for me, I thought, okay, got it. So for me, it is right. If you write the paragraphs, that, well, that's scenes. Because it's a collection of mm-hmm. pictures to me, and hopefully the pictures make sense to me. The pictures, when people read, will be different because diff- they've got different influences. But as long as the pictures that they've got make sense and they're going the same way, um, get to the end of the chapter. Hope they're short and sharp chapters as much as possible, so people can put it down and come back to it. But that's when the adverts come on, mm-hmm. maybe like the Daz and the Colgate yeah, 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 and all, yeah, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Then you get back to it because we. You know, whether we know it or unconsciously, you know, we, we, we all know free act drama. And obviously things, you look at soaps, they go into five acts. Yeah. Right? But ultimately, it's a storytelling based on mm-hmm. ancient Greek storytelling. No, but, but actually that comes across in your books as well. It is a very visceral um, reading. Uh, you know, you, some books are more, you're, you're, you're removed from the process, the yes, storytelling. Yes. Well, slightly. first person narrative helps in, yeah. a, in a big mm-hmm. way on that to make it more sort of, mm-hmm. of close in. And, and obviously the, the use of reference. So you can, you can use a lot of words to describe something. And again, the, the, the reaction to it will be different in, in whoever to sort of reading it because there are influences. But then you can do just short, sharp words like, yeah. you know, scratching nails down a blackboard. Mm-hmm. Boom. So you've, you, take you know, you've got it. You've mm-hmm. got it. And then you can move on. And, 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 the, and the simple stuff that certainly, you know, uh, uh, Michael showed me was this whole thing of, of just setting stuff up so you can set, we're in a room now. So we set this room up in a non, you know, jeopardy way. Mm-hmm. So we're sitting here, we're drinking coffee, we're doing all that sort of stuff. So when we come back into this room and there's action, whether it's, it, whether it's dialogue or, or it's physical mm-hmm. action, we don't have to describe the room. And what you can do is concentrate on yeah. what's going on. And unconsciously, we already know the room if the job's done right in describing yeah. it. So all of a sudden, as well as reading more of the story, taking the story forward, Actually, our unconscious at the same time going, you're really, really smart because you know that room. Mm-hmm. Because they're doing it. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you, we know about the fan because it was a pain when it was blowing when we were doing yeah, nothing. Yeah. So all of a sudden he falls over and picks up the fan. We know about the fan. Yeah. So you don't You've have to explain it. it. Yeah. We don't have to explain it. And all of a sudden, like the endorphin goes, yeah, you're clever. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you yeah. know I, I already know the fans there. You know, and so it's those tricks that really, really sort of help me because obviously he does it visually. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the way that I write is visual anyway, mm-hmm. so you know, it, it yeah it helps a lot. I was interested to know once you'd done your Bravo Two Zero and you had your you had your kind of publisher, um, when you wanted to then shift into the into the fiction work, did you stick with the same 
with the same agent and stuff at that point, or was that quite hard to to get into that speed of things? No, no, no. Stick with the the, the, the same agent and the and, and the same publisher, and it it just seemed a natural extension. Um, it, now it seems a natural extension. I wasn't actually thinking about it because it's then they 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 came to me, and it was maybe only about I don't know eight or nine years ago where I started to have these if you like, proper contracts where it would be a free con- uh, book contract because mm-hmm. it's always like a punt. Yeah. And they go, would you not want to do another one? Of course, of course I want to do another one. But, you know, let's just do one, see how it goes. And and then certainly when um, uh, Random House became, a, you know, this, this huge sort of multinational in the United States and all that sort of stuff, um, by then it was it was uh, um, what was known as a budget author. They can quantify how much money yeah. they're going to make out of me out of each mm-hmm. territory. So... Uh, they want to know that they <laughs> they can quantify for yeah. you know and, and quite rightly they're going well we you know we want this three year projection and so you know, again maybe, yeah maybe seven eight years ago um, done these formal three book contracts mm-hmm. everything else up before that was just a punt see how it yeah. goes see how it goes and going, uh, taking a step back slightly back to when you were leaving the army did you have to uh, presume you you had to say to the army look I want to I've got a publisher interested in this yes. book. Um, yeah, yeah, is that yeah. okay and all that sort yeah, of yeah, stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's, 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 well, the, the, it has different names at the moment. It's called yeah. the Disclosure Committee. So, um, uh, basically, when, when I decided to do it myself, I went back to the, you know, the, the, these uh, senior officers and said, right, look, if I do it, I'll do it myself. And then, uh, what happens is then that there's, there's a quite a well established process within the Ministry of Defence where you, you know, you submit the manuscript, they come in. The, the term Official Secrets Act is quite a archaic sort of term, mm. but, you know, the media uses it all the time yeah. because it's, it's something we've got in our yeah. head. But actually it, it's the, uh, uh, the, uh, national securities, right. um, uh, legislation that is, that is more relevant and, and more mm. important. And basically it's looking at something, um, uh, whether it's fiction or non-fiction and, trying to work out whether it affects national security. So it might be something, a technique I'm talking about, or it may be something that I'm talking about that kick off questions but leads to something else. Mm-hmm. So what happens is it goes to the disclosure committee, then yeah. you know, they say, right, we're, you know, we're concerned about this. And certainly on fiction, go, okay, we'll just change it, you know, change the name, change the location. Mm-hmm. I had one bizarrely years and years ago, um, where I was talking about what's called a boot fit, where people are hiding in, in, in vehicles and all this sort of stuff, waiting to um, uh, uh, what called trigger somebody out of a building so right. they could follow. And um, I had it in a in a in a certain type of uh, vehicle, and I said, "Well, can you change the vehicle?" They go, okay. Yeah. So I say, "Well, actually, there's some legislation to do with that vehicle and, and, a, and a boot right. fit. So let's get that. So change it to a Citroen. You know, right. so that's yeah, fine. Yeah. So there's, uh-huh. there's stuff like that. And then sometimes because I might be writing about something because I don't know where it, it yeah, it's yeah. going. Um, uh, and it, yeah, and it's got, it's a very good system actually. You sit down and and it, is is it something that you still have to do now, yeah, even with yeah, your yeah, books yeah, now? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And, it, and it works well. So the it, it quite interesting. Certainly when what not when Bravo was published, but when Bravo became um, this sort of massive hit, there was sort of a bit of a backlash in the media by people who didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. So I was literally coming out of the Ministry of Defence getting in a, a military staff car and driving off to Sandhurst, the military academy where mm-hmm, officers mm-hmm. are trained, uh, to give the Christmas lecture after post uh, uh, Bravo. So I'm sitting there and it, not, it, I think it was a Vauxhall Vectra, it's, you know, nothing too exciting yeah, yeah. in the car, but it's sitting there, so you got all the day's papers there. And I, so I'm reading whatever it was, the Telegraph, and there's, you know, I don't know, ex-Colonel Blimpy, Blimp, or yeah. whatever he's called, and saying, no, oh, it's an outrage, he's leaking, like I say, without not a clue what's going yeah, on, yeah. you know. Uh-huh. Um, and it, actually, initially, I was quite annoyed about it, but, but probably now I wish it happened every year. Yeah, every time you get all that publicity, it'd exactly. be fantastic. There's yeah. no such thing as bad publicity. No, yeah, it's great. Say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you that so it's led to a huge amount of books that you've written since yeah. Bravo. Yeah, um, I think there's over th- over thirty five. Five, yeah, thirty five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Including the young adult and all the yeah. reads and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, so. It, how many are you doing a year on that, sir? It's famine or feast. It, yeah. it, it, it's basically, certainly with the, uh, the, the, the quick reads, because they're only sort of maximum 15,000 words, they sort of, they, they, they sort of 
fit in between times, you know, because you don't do it as a, a complete piece of work. So you're bouncing around doing that. And I said, mm. we need a quick read for, you know, you know next month. So 15,000 words, okay, well, we can get on and, and go and do that. Um, sometimes with the deals with the young adult yeah. books, um, and there's a, a weird sort of publishing dysfunct in timings between the United right, States okay. and you mm-hmm. know what you call home territories in yeah, the yeah. UK, Australia, New Zealand. So and then so the, the sometimes the, the publishing gets pushed forward a lot, um, where you're trying to do two at once. So you're doing a, a an adult uh, fiction and uh, a young adult fiction. And in fact, the last lot that I'm doing now with uh, Scholastic, I'm doing it with a guy called Phil Earl, because mm-hmm. basically the, the the timings just do yeah. not work to to get it right to be able to. To fulfill, you know, the 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 the, the sort of the American timings mm-hmm. and their commitments and and, and home territories, um, but yeah, it's just a matter of getting on with it. And it's, um, you know, sign a bit of paper, you take the money, you got to get on yeah, with it, and absolutely. you've got to deliver yeah. all this stuff. People think that you know publishers are there in I don't know, corduroy jackets with arm sort <laughs> of little sweat. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you don't deliver on time, there's financial penalties yeah, because yeah. they've got to do their process mm-hmm. and ultimately. Get it in the shops, get it on Amazon, because mm-hmm. they've got to sell it. That's their job. And you, you're, for example, the Next Stone series uh, of books, are you planning, you know, several books ahead, or are you just saying, right, this is the next Next Stone book and that's what I'm doing? No, that, it, it's not ahead at all. Yeah. Um, not ahead at all. So um, what I constantly do, which I, I think is sort of most writers really do, is just, you know, be nosy, basically. You know, you're reading stuff. You know, if you read something and you get something online, just cut it and paste it and keep it in a mm-hmm. folder and all that that, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and, and it's really about this time of the year, because I'm going to start in January. It's normally this time of year trying to formulate what it's right. all about. Because what you're trying to do is, is get to a point where you're doing um, almost prediction fiction, but mm-hmm. not too much prediction yeah. in case you're totally wrong. It mm-hmm. looks stupid. But you're trying to sort of make it as contemporary as, as, yeah. as possible, but at the same time, give the book longevity because hopefully someone's still going to read it in the backlist yeah. in 10 years' Absolutely, time. Yeah. So it's trying to get that, that, that sort mm-hmm. of balance. So no, there's no big, long um, plan at mm-hmm. all, actually. And I, and I found myself... Messing up a bit with Nick Stone, um, eight, nine years ago, where, um, there was a, the part of the, the, the story was a, a, a young girl called Kelly who he was with and he's running around, but Kelly was getting older. Mm-hmm. And actually the, 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 the choice then is then, okay, what do you do with Kelly? Do you have a, then, uh, having this, you know, all right, you can have a gobby teenager for mm-hmm. it's only so long and then she's going to grow, she's going to mature. So do you, Keep her and mm-hmm. then have her as almost role reversal where she becomes the parent because yeah. Nick's a bit of a, an emotional dwarf. Yeah. So she becomes the, uh, the one. Or actually, we all like her. She's about 16. Let's just kill her and get it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just get it. So you get to the point and then she's dead. So she's out of the way. Don't have to worry about her anymore. And hopefully we've liked this yeah, yeah. girl for so long. When she gets it, uh, you know, everyone's sad. Ah, great. Yeah. And then and obviously Nick's sad and then he moves on. Mm-hmm. I have a question about the ideas that, that you come up with, because obviously the Next Stone series and your other uh, fiction stuff, you've got so many of them. And when you are coming up with an idea, do you ever base it on your own experience or knowledge that you've got as a jumping off point? Yeah, as, as much as possible, because then it's it's um, it's a lot easier to write because <laughs> you've got yeah. it. Yeah. It, um, so one of the things that, 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 that continued after I got out in the military, obviously I went down to Columbia, worked for the PMC. I landed up on the, on the board of this, this private military company. And so a lot was going on. Obviously there was, you know, the, the, uh, at that time, so there was all the Somali piracy that was going on, all those sort of environments. Then I become uh, an advisor with the Ministry of Defense for just under 10 years to do with the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars, you know, going over there predominantly with infantry battalions, doing some advisory stuff. And, um, all of the time, like looking and listening because it, then you can take real circumstances out of their environments and then move them mm-hmm. to a, literally to another part of the planet and plop them in. Yeah. And the more things that went wrong, the better because obviously it's a thriller. They've yeah. got to go wrong. Yeah, exactly. So it, it was moving around. And there was one um, during the, 
height of the Somali um, uh, kidnapping, where we we had people that would do the the uh, uh, what's called KNR kidnap and ransom, mm-hmm. doing the negotiations, and so all of those phone conversations they're all you know recorded and transcribed and all that. So in one of the stories, I had you know somebody caught mm-hmm. up in Somalia and all that, and literally I just took the dialogue, changed the names and the location, <laughs> and that was like you know two thousand words yeah. done. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just trying to take out. Anything and then put it in because you can chop and change the scenarios. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But and so more of that, the better. You can't, yeah, you can't be accused of it not being realistic. No, at that, at that and, and the thing is, there is that you know they'll click. Well, reason it's cliche because it's true. Right about what yeah, you know. Exactly. Well, exactly. That's exactly. it. Exactly. Um, and are you a big planner before your stories, or do you sort of start them with an idea and see where it goes? Um, I, I'm a planner, not a big planner. So um, what I do is is I. I, I write a sort of treatment, mm-hmm. as if I'm doing a, a treatment, say, for a TV show yeah. or something, or a sort of uh, 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 treatment. Play about with that, not too much, but a little bit. And then what I do, I use Final Draft, which is script writing mm-hmm. software. And what I use is the uh, storyboard part of it, which is basically movable, you know, movable um, post-its yeah. around. So what I do is because of the, the experiences that, you know, and, and sort of what I've learned uh, uh, working on films um, and the way that I write anyway visually, so then I start storyboarding it in acts, you know, mm-hmm. prologue, free acts, yeah. epilogue, and I start storyboarding it. Um, and the beauty of that is you can boom, boom, move it mm-hmm. around. And, and some of it is quite procedural in the way that, all right, three acts, you need three major... Yeah. Points of action, Insight three major, yeah, yeah, all that stuff, mm-hmm. all that, all that sort of stuff, um, and then from there, kick off. But I would imagine at least forty percent changes on the way, whether the characters mm-hmm. change, and then sometimes the characters change, they're too good, yeah. you know, because it makes Nick look stupid, <laughs> yeah. you know, because you know somebody finds this out. Well, actually, you know, our hero should find that. Yeah. Out. So come back and redo that. Redo that. So and so yeah, there, there's 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 preparation, but not. In depth, mm-hmm. um, I wish I could actually. It'd be like, yeah, mm-hmm. do it and then just get on and do it. But, it but I, th- I think there is that danger if you over plan something that it becomes a bit stilted in the in the writing. Well, do you know, it, it's it's you know, obviously, constantly sort of meet people who who are you know, starting to write or want to write or or actually do write, and then all you know, all these sort of writers block and all this sort of stuff. Because yeah. people, it seems that are trying to formulate in their head exactly what they're going to put down and you go no it doesn't work like that you know and that's why it'll buzz around for weeks Mm -hmm. you know the the, the fact is write it down even if you know it's rubbish Mm because actually you read it tomorrow you go yeah that's crap what I really mean is this Mm -hmm. and then you can start to layer it and you can bounce off uh, other ideas you know um, but you know people think they've got to get it in their head and it's impossible. Get it in the head and then get it down. It doesn't work. No, no, it definitely doesn't work like that. You say, what's, what's part, what part of the writing process do you enjoy the most? Is it the action stuff or the character stuff? No, I like, I, I like both, actually. But what I do, I like it after Easter when I've got a workable draft. So that's why I like Easter's being late because it gives me a bit more time. <laughs> but in my head, I'll start in January, got to go Easter. But then... Uh, you know, there's 120,000 words, so I'll probably have uh, between 50 and 70, depending, mm. and it'll be a mixture, and I've got the structure, and then what it is is that, conti- which I've done with Bravo, you know, the way that, that they were shown, is just continuously just layer, and then you're cutting apart, oh, that's, oh, I'll move that up there, and I'll move this here, um, and you can then start to check continuity of dialogue mm. as well throughout the, mm-hmm. throughout the text. And so um, uh, I, I actually like quite... Bu- uh, yeah, I, I, I like both really. I think that one of the things that when I did start to read, I thought a lot of dialogue, is, and again, these are sort of older sort of books, you know, techniques have changed now, but I thought a lot of dialogue was was quite stilted. Mm-hmm. It was almost grammatically correct. In some cases, people were talking in tense. Nobody talks in tense today. Mm-hmm. So how, you know, to play with that, with that, that dialogue. Yeah. Um, and even if you're using sort of, you know, a different vocab because it's whatever it is, I know it's a military guy or it's a, mm-hmm. you know, it's a robber or whatever it is. It's basically, you know, it's just, well, if you're using it because it, it sounds good and then just pff, set it up earlier on. Mm-hmm. So then people feel invested in that dialogue mm-hmm. um, and just try to be as realistic as possible with 
um, if you like, the action, the violence, mm -hmm. but particularly, you know, so, you know, the hero is, you know, is, is hurt just as much, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the magic headbutt or whatever it is. Well, he's, you know, he's head spinning yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, all that sort of stuff, just trying to be realistic. Um, well, because of 18 years in the army, I used to get beaten up, you know. It's like, you know, young squaddies in the garrison town, you know, just protecting your kebab on a Saturday night and all that, all that sort of stuff that goes on. So it, it's that sort of stuff, you know. And again, so, you, you know, use those experiences yeah. and, and, and get it into, you know, um, uh, a story that, uh, you know, first, it's, it, you know, not bogging down too much because it's action but actually just trying to give enough to kick off people's imagination mm -hmm. because they've got so much influence through film and TV anyway. Yeah. And do you, do you show it to uh, anyone before you sort of submit it to the publisher? Do you, do you let some, you know, if you get stuck at some point no. or anything like that? No, no, it's just, no, you, it's just yeah. crack on. And the, the relationship with the, with the editor is stunning. Mm -hmm. Is um, you know, years ago there used to be like a, well, it's, it's all done electronically mm -hmm. now, but initially when it was out, it'd be a little red circle. I don't quite understand this, you know. And now it's like a big sort of line. It's going, what the F is this? You know, you go, oh, yeah, Bill, right, yeah. What I mean is, it's like, well, write it. I go, okay. <laughs> and you yeah. get on with it. So, no, it's great. So he gets first hit. Yeah. Um, and then, I, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do the rewrite. Um, and then, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. Next time. Um, and so if you're starting a book in January, what sort of, it, I know it would vary with every book, but if you're saying January, you want a workable draft by Easter. When would you like to say, right, that's that one done now and I moved on? Third of July. Third of yeah, July. Third of July. That's what the contract says, yeah. So, uh, and you normally get about sort of a week grace, you know, you're okay. normally about three weeks before and you get literally, ah, how's it okay. going, you know, right. all that sort okay. of stuff. So we go through that protocol, but yeah, no, it's, it's the date, boom, get it right. in. So for me, it's Easter and then there's something that, if you like, the meat of it's there and then it's getting on with it. Mm -hmm. And what we said before, because you've got it there, you've got your structure, you've got your story, you've got your arcs, all that stuff yeah. you need, you can then concentrate on the visuals mm -hmm. and the dialogue to make sure yeah. it writes. And, all, and, and sometimes, like, you know, two, three thousand words have just come mm -hmm. because that's what it needs at that point. Yeah. And you know exactly what's going on because you've got the structure. Yeah, absolutely. I have to see you, you've written. Oh, sorry, Terry. No, sorry, I have to say, I just said that I have to say that um, writing writing dialogue is something that I've always struggled with, and I wonder if you had any tips for listeners out there that on, on how to really write a good scene between two characters talking that doesn't feel like it's just expositiony. Yeah, I, th I think that the certainly you know the, the the when people are writing dialogue, as we said before, people try to get too much perfection in their head before writing it. If you can't think of the the actual lines you want, it, you move on. And what you do, you just put up there, you know, it, whichever way you want to do it, uppercase, you know, bold, whatever you want to do, going, you know, what is the purpose of that dialogue? What is he going to say? Mm -hmm. And then, so you've got it there, and then you carry on. Uh, and what you find is as you're going down, all of a sudden that'll, that'll kick off, but it will come back. So rather than leaving it, you'll just put in the, if you like, the progression of the dialogue, if you haven't got the lines for that that piece, but you've got, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you've, you haven't got 30% of the lines. Mm -hmm. Well, you just say what it is. And what you can see then is the progression of that dialogue and where you want to end it. You know, whether it's a, a completion yeah. or something, a question or a drama or a fight or whatever. But, um, uh, and, and also in, in the way of, you know, not being able to work out that exactly what you want to be say, uh, be saying because people sometimes don't feel confident enough to write it as it would be said, because they think, oh, I'm writing. Yeah, yeah, you're writing, but you're writing to somebody who doesn't speak like that in the mm -hmm. first place. Yeah. And they would understand the dialogue. You know, we, you know, we're watching soaps, we're watching, you know, the films and all that sort of stuff. We get it, you know, and it's mm -hmm. just trying to be, uh, 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 more confident where you can say something and say, people will get that. So it's short and concise, because mm -hmm. that's how we speak anyway. Yeah. You know, without trying to over explain it, mm -hmm. because you think, well, they may not understand that reference. Well, if they're not going to understand it, don't use it. Use something else if you really think that, you yeah. know, or have the confidence to actually do it um, to to get that sort of dialogue over. But also in an environment of something, if it's already been set up, as we said before, in the you know we're in this room here. There's a fan. We've got coffee. We've got bottles of water. All that sort of stuff go, going on. If you've already set it up, so what happens? You've got the dialogue, and then you can put in the interaction between the two people because you can say something like. Oh, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's chatting away as he leans over to the fridge. Mm -hmm. You know what he's going to get out of the fridge because you've already set it up, you know. Yeah. So all of a sudden, the unconscious guy, all right, he's going to get some water. And then you leave it. And then all of a sudden, 
you know, the, you know, hero can hear the, the fizziness going of the, of the water mm-hmm. it's pouring. So you're having all this interaction and an environment around you, um, noises outside, ambient noises, whatever it is. The more you set up beforehand, the easier it is to really put that in so you don't have to clog up the, the dialogue with all the, you know, what's going on, what's not going on, and you know, all that sort of stuff. But, uh, but at the same time, give that environment and really concentrate on the dialogue. And I can see that the, what you were saying about layering stuff up layer, that'll layer. help. Yeah, absolutely. Well and that. you know, and it's just stopping to think. Well, we've all you know, we've all mm-hmm. sat in a in a hotel room. You know, so saying, okay, you know, what are the noises? What are, there's all you know, the hum of a yeah. air conditioner or something. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, you know, you could even set things up if you're spending a lot of time doing a lot. So we're a couple of spies and we're meeting up mm-hmm. in a hotel all the time. You know, one of the spies must absolutely hate. Yeah. The air conditioning. So he turns it off and the other one loves it because now he's sweating. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, yeah. and so you've got all these things that you can do. It. But the most important thing is where's the dialogue? What are you trying to achieve with that dialogue? Mm-hmm. You know, give information away or get to the point where something's going to happen mm-hmm. because of it. And you've, you've written a few books with other people. Um, how does that work? How does that process work? Uh, very easy. I think that, and that's all part of, 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 of selecting people who yeah, it works. Sure. Yeah, very easy. So, um, uh, well, we'll, we'll come up in effect with a pitch. We have our own pitch. So we write it out. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, and, and certainly we say, right, I'll do that. You do that. I'll do that. You do that. And what we do, we buzz it between ourselves mm-hmm. and have an, have an agreement that we can really criticize each other. If you yeah. think it's crap, go, look, that's crap. Yeah, yeah. But no one else can do it. So you would do it within your bubble, mm-hmm. if you like, just the, the, the pair of you in, in the bubble. And that gives both people quite a lot of freedom mm-hmm. to come in and out because they're both knowing that they're, they're in a creative mm-hmm. process. So you can criticize because a lot of people find it hard to criticize yeah. uh-huh. or hard to take criticism. Mm-hmm. So you say, well, okay, well, what, we do, what we're trying to do is create something that someone's going to read and hopefully they're going to enjoy. So, you know, and there's two minds at it. Mm-hmm. So that what we've got to do is be able to criticize each other. Mm-hmm. And not only that, come up with the suggestions that we're criticizing, see what you think. Does yeah. that work? All right, let's try it out. And so, um, uh, and it's literally what we do. And then just send each other stuff if we're, you know, geographically away, send each other stuff. And then we can just, you know, Skype, all the rest of the stuff. Mm-hmm. We don't use, well, I've never, never used any collaborative uh, software no. to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always been done because I think using that is too instant. There's not enough time for the, the, the brain to tick around. Yeah. The brain to tick right. around. Use it in sometimes script writing um, because it's by then it's normally um, mm. little sort of incidents that mm-hmm. need refining rather than fundamentally changing. And talking about script writing, um, is is that something that you're wanting to do more of, script writing? Yeah I, yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And it's... Um, uh, and again, it was an opportunity that was given me years ago, writing mm. Bravo 2.0 with the BBC, mm. all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'll give it a go. Yeah, um, uh, and try and find out people who know what they're doing mm. and work out. Again, Michael Mann, great help, you know. And um, uh, I, I quite enjoy it, actually. I quite enjoy f- it. Feels It feels a lot easier than writing long form. Mm. Uh, but the reality is, you know, no. it just takes as yeah. long. It's, you know, because you've got, you know, I don't know. In, in, you know, you've got maximum six lines of dialogue, which would probably take, you know, three, you know, three four pages. You know, you know, sort of, you know six, seven hundred words mm-hmm. or something. But, um, but it takes the same time. But actually, it sort of feels easier. I don't but know why. You, you're you, you're very visual in your prose writing, so that must help with screenwriting as no, well. No, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And it, it's um, uh, that that whole again the setups are always, 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 always. And then, but when you're doing the setups and, and certain environments, and, and and it's it's trying to make it very um, uh, concise, obviously, because mm-hmm. you know ultimately with, with scripts, um, one of the downfalls when people are, are getting in, in script right, there's too much description. Mm-hmm. There's there's there, there's too much dialogue. So when Producers, directors, actors read. They don't want that because they generate it themselves because mm. you want to get them to the point where they're generating all these ideas. They're generating all their pictures. And the more you write down, there is the more to say, I don't like it. So it's, it's, it's almost like a con job initially, getting them in, 
So their own, their own imagination, so there's these cue words that you hear all the time, mm. you know, like it's dark, it's cold, it's wet, it's, you know, all yeah, these yeah. sort of things, bang, right, it's got it. Yeah. And then it can move on. That's uh, Laura messaging us to see if we're nearly done. So <laughs> I better not uh, <laughs> keep you much longer. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, you know, what, what's next? What, what, what are the next things coming up in your sleep? Um, well, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, a new book that I'll start in January 2020. Go for that project. Process, you know, Easter and then getting in in, in the start of July. Um, and again, um, uh, as we said before, I'm not too sure at the moment whether it's going to be a Nick Stone or whether it's going to be another standalone um, uh, story. Um, I don't know, because it's like at the moment it's on the book yeah. that, that I'm with now. Mm. And then you say, right, get that done, dink, and then get on with, with, with mm. the next one, really. Because actually what I've ever found is that that sometimes if, if you're working on one uh, you know book and you're sort of still with the other one, you start mixing up. And mm. um, so I'm doing that, and then I'm, I'm, I'm writing a, uh, a script. Actually, I'm not writing a script. It's wrong. What I'm doing is doing a rewrite on a script on a alien film, which is one extreme to the other. It's going to be fantastic. It's great. Big alien film, and it's you know it's um, uh, uh, you know it's snow, it's dark, it's forestry blocks, and there's aliens. Brilliant. Oh, great. Yeah. Wow, that that sounds, sounds fantastic. Good. Yeah. Um, so what was the last book that you read? Um, uh, Talking to Strangers, Malcolm Clevel. Okay. Just literally just finished it. And the uh, last film you saw? Um, oh, bloody hell. Do you know what? Joker. Oh, right. I just saw okay. it last week. What yeah, did Joker. you think? I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. Absolutely. If you took out the DC element mm-hmm. and all that, it could be a psychological yeah, thriller. It could it's be, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think the, the suggestion was that they put the DC element in so that they could make it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have got Fantastic. It worked yeah. for me. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Thought, I thought it was amazing. Um, last TV show you watched? Um, oh, the, the, the third series um, of Fargo. Oh, right. um, which has been out for ages, mm-hmm. isn't it? But, you know, I do the Netflix thing and say, I'll watch that one day. Yeah. And then get caught, as you do, you watch two and you land up for the whole series, <laughs> two days watching yeah. a whole lot. I think it was the best one ever, actually. Yeah, I yeah. really enjoyed it. Um, and then the last thing we do is an either or. So we just throw out two yeah. things and you pick. So, Tarek, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, Zero Dark Thirty or The Hurt Locker? Hurt Locker. Um, TV or cinema? TV. Uh, line of Duty or Bodyguard? Line of Duty. Uh, real book or e-book? Oh, you got me there now. I mean, it's a difficult one for me, isn't <laughs> I know, it? I know, I know. But I've got to admit, e-book, I've got okay. to admit, get it on the phone and it's a lot easier. I know, Excellent. that's how I'm going to get hung now. I? <laughs> and the, the last one, uh, would you rather eat in or go out to a fancy restaurant? Uh, eat in. Perfect. In front of the TV, of course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Watching Fargo. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Andy. I thought it was a really interesting chat um, and he had a lot of useful information there, I thought. Um, particularly what he had to say, I think, about the three-act structure and also layering the story. You know, I think there can be a pressure, especially if you're starting out as a writer, to feel that you have to nail a whole story the first time you write it. And I think that idea of going back over it and adding layers to the story to to add depth to the story is a really useful tip. As mentioned, Andy was kind enough to sign a couple of books for us to give away as prizes in a competition. So what we're going to do is give away two prizes, one copy of his latest book, Whatever It Takes, uh, and one of his earlier book, Line of Fire, both signed by Andy. And along with each of those prizes comes a copy of your own page one notebook to help you with your own writing. So there are a number of ways to enter. Um, We've done social media posts about the competition on our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram accounts. Um, I'll put the links in the podcast description, but uh, our Twitter handle is at right underscore gear. Facebook is right gear UK, all one word. And Instagram is right underscore gear underscore UK. It would have been more helpful to have the same handle for them all, but uh, that wasn't possible. So there's different ways to enter. On Twitter, if you could follow, like, and retweet the competition tweet, then you'll be entered in. On Facebook, if you could like and share the competition post. 
And on Instagram, if you tag a friend or fellow writer who you think would like to win the prize, uh, then you'll be entered into the competition. There's one more way for podcast listeners to enter the competition, and that's to uh, follow and subscribe on your fav- favourite app and, and most importantly, leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, the reviews really make a difference to our visibility on these podcast apps, so that will really help us. If you do leave a review and enter that way, then if you could maybe also drop us a line uh, at our email address podcast at rightgear.co.uk to let us know which review is yours so that we can make sure that we enter you into the competition and the competition will run until the 30th of November and uh, we'll announce the winner on our last episode of this season which is going to be out on the 6th of December before we take a short break over the Christmas period so I hope that competition is of interest I hope you enter and I hope uh, a couple of our listeners win that Next week, we've got Ian Dallas, a BAFTA award-winning writer of video games for the studio Giant Sparrow. Even if you're not into video games, I would say it's a really interesting episode. It was really interesting hearing how Ian approaches creating these games. His games, like uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, are not what you would call maybe your stereotypical video game. It's not about running and shooting, and um, nor is it a sort of open sandbox, a uh, Grand Theft Auto type story. They're, they're very, I would say, personal pieces of art, really. And it's a, a really interesting chat that we had with Ian. So I hope you tune in for that one. Thanks, as always, to Simon Stokes for his production assistance. If you do want to get in touch with us, please email us at podcast at rightgear.co.uk. If you want to chat about one of the episodes, please leave comments under our Facebook posts about each episode. That would be great. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can get in touch with us via Facebook or on Twitter, which is at right underscore gear. And I'll just leave you with a word about our writer's notebook uh, that we've designed, page one, which is uh, divided into different sections to try and help you plan and structure your next story. Uh, And I'll be back next week. So have a good week and I'll speak to you then. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.